We're continuing our Black History Month series today, and we're going to hear about some remarkable female leaders next on Significant Insights. Hello, welcome to the program. Good to have you. We're in part two of our month-long series celebrating Black History Month. And last week, we learned about the contributions of some lesser-known but incredibly important people like Ralph Bunch, William Seymour, Nathan Scott, and of course, my favorite, the Tuskegee Airmen. And we're going to continue our history lesson today with Dr. Vince Gaddis, who has taught history at Benedictine University in Illinois for some 20 years. We're going to talk about some strong female leaders in a little bit later, but we start today's program with one of the pioneers of the civil rights movement, W.E.B. Du Bois. He was born in 1868 in part of a very small free black population in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. And among his many accomplishments was becoming one of the founders of the NAACP. Here's more on this remarkable trailblazer. I would put him in as one of the top American intellectuals of the 20th century. Um, his path that he blazed has uh, been directly responsible for really the growth of the black professorate in this country. He was, one of, he was the first African American to get a PhD from Harvard. His Philadelphia Negro, uh, 1899, was one of the first uh, seminal works in this new field called sociology. Um, his book, Black Reconstruction, was, was one of the first texts that really outlined the significance of the Freedmen's Bureau and the difficulties on the ground of implementing and protecting the rights of African Americans. Um, and of course, I, I, his seminal work is uh, uh, 1903, The Souls of Black Folk. Well, what do you think would be, uh, would have, would be considered his best achievement, his most important achievement? I can only have one. All right. Pick I'll two. Have, all right, I'll have two. Okay, okay. I got to pick two. Uh, number one is this book. The Souls of Black Folk, written in oh, okay. 1903, is um, the intellectual foundation of African American scholarship in this century. Huh. Okay. Period. Um, uh, within that, he wrote this chapter uh, of our spiritual strivings, which in six little pages, he brilliantly uncovers what is the, the struggle of identity of being black and being American, of living behind a veil, not really seen from the outside world, and yet looking back at yourself through the veil. And this issue of how do we under, how do we become, maintain who we are as African Americans, and become Americans? He established the ideal. And well, he esta he established the the intellectual understanding of that dual identity, okay. of what he called our two-ness. Right, I'm I'm black. I'm American. I'm uh, I'm I'm passionate about my history. I also understand the problems that are facing me. I see how I'm viewed as less than, but I know that I come from uh, kings. Okay, so that so understanding that the chapter starts with this sentence: the problem of the color line is the problem of the 20th century. And really, that was true, and is still true, that the fault lines of race 
are still in many ways just as deep, maybe deeper, than they ever were. And Du Bois points this out and says, to, you know, if we really want to create an America that lives up to its ideals, we have to stop seeing people as the other, as a problem. I, I, I would say the, the, the second thing, uh, outside of being a big mover and shaker in the Pan-African movement, uh, is Du Bois was one of the leaders of the Niagara Movement, 1905, and the formation of the NAACP. Niagara Movement was what? Uh, the Niagara Movement was a group of uh, uh, m primarily black men who wanted to start some kind of, uh, as I say, movement, some kind of um, uh, uh, organization that would elevate this idea of liberal education, getting African Americans civil rights, and so on. And the Niagara Movement became the, the ideals or the goals of the Niagara Movement, full equality, um, the end of Jim Crow, uh, those kind of, uh, those goals became the crux of the goals for the NAACP. Mm, okay. And so uh, four years later, the NAACP is founded. Uh, du Bois becomes the editor of the magazine of the NAACP called The Crisis, which is still in publication, and uses that as really a, the platform to then express and expose the issues of race in America. So I, if I had to pick two, that would be it. How much of an influence do you believe that he had on Dr. Martin Luther King? Tremendous uh, influence. Uh, we, we, know that, we know that King read <laughs> widely. We know that he read The Souls of Black Folk. We know, and certainly if you look at, go through the King papers and, and, and really study him, uh, you see a lot of the, especially the early King, you see much of the Du Boisian ideal, right? Which was not to create two separate Americas, but one America, an integrated America, and this notion of of, of integrating uh, the races together rather than um, in a legal way get rid of, say, Jim Crow, but remain separate. When we return, we'll talk about women who forged paths that millions ended up walking down. As we go to a break, Dr. Gaddis talks about the civil rights movement as one built by thousands of everyday people. It's a people's history. You know, uh, this particular year, uh, we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the, you know, the uh, march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in, in Selma and so on. But th that history was made by, at that time, young college students like John Lewis and uh, uh, Mose, Edwin Moses, and all, all of these, all these young men uh, uh, who, who were just Andrew Young, who, I mean, you know, they were just working for a change, working for change.
Welcome back. You know, today for Black History Month, we're learning about the contributions of people who weren't necessarily the headliners of the civil rights movement, but they were movers and shakers in their own right. As we continue, let's hear about two of the women who made history. Fannie Lou Hammer. Mm. Tell us about her. Oh, what a, what a, what a wonderful woman. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was born in Mississippi in 1917. Uh, she was an unlettered woman. Uh, her parents were sharecroppers in a cotton plantation. Uh, she dropped out of school at 12 years old and uh, worked on the plantation as a sharecropper. She married a sharecropper. Um, and 1962, she did something that changed the rest of her life and my life, uh, she went to a demonstration on voting to register. So her and oh, about 17 other young people, 18, 19, yeah, yeah, and, and her, they say, okay, uh, we're going to go register. So they go to the courthouse to register to vote, and they are turned away. They're intimidated. She, by the time she gets back home, they have kicked her and her husband off of the plantation. Uh, and she decides, you know what? I'm glad they kicked me off the plantation, is one of her famous quotes. I'm glad they kicked me off the plantation because now I'm finally free. And from that moment, dedicated the rest of her life to civil rights and getting people to vote, and to in register process, to vote. In that process, she almost lost her life more oh, than once. absolutely, yes, but several she was times. beaten so severely at mm -hmm. one point that uh, she ended up with a limp and right. permanent kidney damage. Yes, and, yes, yes, in Winona, Mississippi. And uh, that happened quite a bit. But, you know, one of the important legacies about that is her response after that beating was, I'm just tired of being sick and tired. And she kept on going. You, you know, she had joined SNCC and, and uh, in 64, uh, there was some tension between the SNCC, the student groups, the, uh, the SCLC and, and the sort of what we might call the elite end of the civil rights movement, um, and she refused to also be uh, necessarily told what to do by those leaders as well. Her influence was so powerful because she was, you know, she wasn't 18, she was much older uh, than most of these kids, and, and really in that very powerful matronly way, she became the guide, the mentor for a whole uh, group of these SNCC workers who now, you know, are leading incredible lives, much to her credit. And of course, she was one of the principal organizers in Mississippi of Freedom Summer in 1964, uh, which was the first really coordinated mass attempt to get people in Mississippi to vote. And of course, is the summer that the three young boys, uh, uh, Cheney and the others from New York and the young man from Mississippi yeah. are killed, uh, are, are killed by the Klan. But uh, she f helped form the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. She also ran for Congress in a and she, primary. Right, yes, she did. Uh, she ran, she, she lost. Uh, but she did run, but importantly, and I, I, I want to go back to this, because uh, her leadership in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was really instrumental, because they went to the convention. Uh, Mississippi, the Democratic Party, had an all-white delegation, and they went in opposition, saying, we are also the voice of the people of Mississippi, and we deserve a voice. And there, and there was a lot of pandemonium going on within in the back rooms of 
of the convention that, you know, we don't, uh, how do we deal with this situation? Now, ultimately, the Freedom Democratic Party was not given a, a real voice at the table. They weren't given a vote on delegates or anything like that. But they were allowed to remain seated through the convention. Which was a which which was a pretty big deal in and of itself. But, but they they blew the trumpet and uh, the forces woke up. Exactly. And uh, it it led it led the way. Right. Then to dramatic change. Uh, she gave a television interview uh, in this controversy at the uh, at the convention, and was so eloquent in this interview. Uh, that she became the, you know, this unexpected voice for all of Mississippi, or at least for black people in Mississippi, and, this, and the civil rights movement itself. So yes, unlettered, but very attuned to and willing to sacrifice for justice. Let's talk about one more. Uh, we, we've got a little bit of time left here, uh, Shirley Chisholm. Now, when I was a, a, a younger man, uh, I started really in um, getting into politics during the 1972 convention. I was nine. There was a woman who made a speech on the floor of the convention was the first time that I had seen someone black in front of this kind of an audience and being cheered. And that was Shirley Chisholm. Hmm. Uh, she ran, tried to get the Democratic nomination in 72. Um, a few years earlier, uh, 1968, she was the first African-American woman elected to the U.S. Congress, was a founder of the Black Congressional Black Caucus. She was one of the founders of that organization in 1969. Uh, earlier on in her career, she uh, grew up in Brooklyn, was born in Brooklyn, um, and uh, was actually was you know not trained as a lawyer. She was a she was a nursery school teacher and then went on to do community activism, uh, to work for civil rights, women's rights, and so on, and created an organization uh, uh, within the community that became sort of her springboard in 64 to the New York Assembly and then from there to the U.S. Congress. And then after she retired, went back to teaching and um, was, was just an imp a really significant political figure because at that time we were just the first um, black mayors were being elected. Uh, blacks were making their first real inroads politically really since Reconstruction. Didn't she also have something to do with... Uh uh, providing legislation to provide insurance for domestic workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she she championed that. She championed. Uh, she was part of the coalition that began to uh, restrict the purse strings on the Vietnam War. She worked uh, actually along with um, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan on issues of minimum wage, uh, uh, OSHA, uh, better working conditions for people, very much so. It's interesting that one of the things Shirley Chisholm said was that of my two handicaps, being female put more obstacles in my path than being black. And that's certainly a testament to how far the civil rights movement has progressed. My thanks to Dr. Vince Gaddis for contributing so much to the past two programs on black history. Final thoughts on civil rights right after this. I found that there were certain things that as a black person I was not expected to desire 
or to do. Welcome back. You know, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But legislation does not change people's hearts. That's something God does. Bishop Charles Phillips of New Covenant Church in Aurora, Illinois, talks about this in today's final thoughts. I came to this area in 1965 seeking opportunity and found what I was looking for in the way of jobs, employment, an opportunity to educate myself and to further my education and to open businesses. Not without challenges though, I found that there were certain things that as a black person I was not expected to desire or to do and roadblocks were put in my way f from the government and even uh, from just the citizens, the attitude of the citizens in this area. But I persisted and overcame those obstacles. Nevertheless, they hinder many people from reaching their potential. They uh, are there systematically, and I believe that we as a nation must rise above that. I believe and hope that change is on the way, change will soon uh, appear because the scripture reminds us that no man is an island to himself. It says that king, the hearts of kings and queens are in God's hand, and God turns them in any direction he chooses. And so I believe through prayer and persistence in educating ourselves, in demonstrating uh, how valuable we are as citizens to this country, as we have always done, is really the answer to a, a wider change and to overcome this uh, desire of a few to gravitate back to the way things were when the rights of the poor and blacks and minorities were non-existent and not withheld within our laws. And I believe that it is incumbent upon the federal government to take a uh, to involve itself in the rights of all people. I believe that too much autonomy is given to the small cities which cater to a few and to the hurt and neglect of many. I believe that we must 
again, include God's plan in what we do from the federal government through every stage of government. For the word of God reminds us that righteousness exalts any nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so from the moral lifestyles that have been existed in, uh, that have been legalized in our government to the uh, non-protection of people of color as it relates to crimes, violent crimes committed against them, as they, ha as they have been tolerated by the government, it is tearing away at the inner fabric of our nation. And so I believe that we as ministers, Christians, all begin, need to begin to pray and begin to persevere and begin to uh, express our dis, uh, disapproval of the mistreatment of any people. May God bless you. May God keep you. Thank you, Bishop Phillips. We appreciate that word very much. Uh, you know, as we think about the two women that we heard about today, um, what they basically did, they found their place and they made a difference. And you know, all of us have a place. You have a place. You may not think you do. In fact, I've talked to people who really don't feel they have much to offer in life at all. But every one of us has a place. It might be as a parent, it might be as a leader, it might be in any one of a lot of different places, but all of us have a place and we can all make a difference. And I want you to remember that. It's very important for every one of us to find our place that God has given us and then to seek to make a difference with our lives. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.